in these dark days, many people are looking for ways to bring light back into our world. I learned this week that ABC reporter Julia Baird has just released a new book. It's called Phosphorescence, talking about things that take in light and then can keep emitting that light even when the light source has passed. It's a book that's come out of her own dark battle with cancer and seems remarkably timely when we're living under the shadow of pandemic. Julia Baird said she wanted to write about how people find strength through despair, light through darkness. She says, when our world goes dark, when we're overwhelmed by illness or heartbreak, loss or pain, how do we survive, stay alive and even bloom? In the muck and grit of a daily existence full of disappointments and a disturbing lack of control over many of the things that matter most, finite relationships, fragile health, fraying economies, a planet in peril, how do we find, nurture and carry our own inner living light, a light to ward off the darkness? Today marks a special day for us as Christians, a day Christians all around the world gather to remember a resurrection when Jesus was dead, buried and then raised to glorious life, when the darkness of our world was swallowed up by God's radiant light. On this day, we remember a day that stands taller than all other days, when God's new creation began to dawn and we were invited to bask in the light of God's victorious love. This was the day when all the dark things in the world were put on notice. Death and disease, sin and Satan, like rotten food ready to be thrown in the trash, these things have an expiry date. Luke has long prepared us for this moment. He's the masterful author who's used stories and images and pictures and metaphors like rays of light directing us to the sun. They were preparing us for the surprise of resurrection life. Luke was preparing us, weaving together this intricate thread of Old Testament hopes and longings and expectations, promises given to Israel in their own dark days. And Luke writes to tell us that in Jesus, the light has come. So today there's three images I want to show you from Luke's gospel, three images that were preparing us for this glorious fulfillment in Jesus' resurrection. Three images, a dove, a jubilee, and a new exodus. So first, a dove. In Luke 3, right at the beginning of Jesus' public ministry, Jesus gets baptised in the Jordan River. And as Jesus emerges from the waters, the Holy Spirit descends, Luke says, with an appearance like a dove. Why does the Spirit appear like a dove? Like, why not? an eagle or a falcon or a hawk or some other bird. Well, this scene reminds us of another time we saw a dove descend upon the waters. So it's in the story of Noah and the flood, if you remember this. Remember, the flood was God's act of judgment. It was an act of decreation. The land is returned back to its pre-creation state when waters covered the land and darkness was over the surf surface of the deep. So Noah's in his boat. And he's waiting for these destructive waters to recede. And so he sends a dove from the boat. And when the dove returns with an olive branch, Noah knows it's now safe to leave the boat. The waters have subsided. Life can begin again. And so begins a new act of creation. The dove was the sign, and so it is here at Jesus' baptism, where the Holy Spirit appears like a dove. It's a new sign that with Jesus, life can begin again. It's a new sign of God's new act of creation in Jesus. The second image is a jubilee. So not long after Jesus' baptism, we see Jesus enter the synagogue. It's a Sabbath day. And Jesus stands and proclaims his mission that he's come, verse 19, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. Now, that's a quote from back in Isaiah, but it's also picking up something bigger from the Old Testament law in Leviticus called the year of Jubilee. The year of Jubilee was this once-in-a-lifetime event. It followed a series of Sabbaths 
which made it like this super Sabbath. So you know there's the weekly Sabbath, one rest every seven days. There was also a Sabbath year. Once a year, you get a rest. There's no planting or harvesting or working the land. And then finally, there's this year of Jubilee. It, it happens once every seven times seven years, 49 years. It's the ultimate Sabbath, a once in a lifetime event where anyone who owed massive debts or, or who'd lost their land or who was working as a servant could be released and could get back their land and could clear their debts. It was this special time of feasting and forgiveness and fullness and freedom. It's a complete new start, a whole new life. Now, there's no evidence that the Israelites actually ever observed the year of Jubilee until Jesus arrives announcing it's here. The year of the Lord's favour, the year of Jubilee. Come to me and receive this once in a lifetime opportunity. It's a new start. And it's a new life that will last forever. So can you see these building images about what Jesus has come to do? The, the dove at Jesus' baptism, a sign of the new creation. And the year of Jubilee, a sign of forgiveness and freedom. Our final image is the new exodus. This comes from Luke 9. Uh, Jesus is on a mountain with a couple of his disciples and suddenly Jesus' face starts radiating light. His face is glowing. His clothes are like flashes of lightning. And then Moses and Elijah appear and they're having a chat about Jesus' departure, which he was about to bring to fulfillment in Jerusalem. Literally, it says they spoke about his exodus. Of course, the Exodus was that great salvation event in the Old Testament story where Moses led the people of Israel out of slavery in Egypt and into the promised land. That's a perfect image of what Jesus has come to do. He's come to rescue us and free us, to lead us out of slavery to death and sin and Satan, to bring us into eternal rest in him. So these are just a few of these grand images that Luke wove into the story, the, the dove at Jesus' baptism, the promised year of Jubilee in Jesus' synagogue sermon, and finally this hope of a new exodus. Hopes that were left scattered to the winds of the Old Testament, left to collect dust like an old book on a shelf. But now Jesus comes and he blows off the dust because he's come to bring these hopes to life. Luke was working hard to prepare us for this moment. He was raising our hopes and expectations and Jesus was raising the stakes. He said, I'll die and I'll come back. But nothing could prepare us for the mind boggling truth of Jesus' resurrection. So Luke reminds us that Jesus' resurrection happens on the first day of the week. It means it's right after the Sabbath day. That makes sense. Because remember, Luke has been preparing us to expect something far bigger than the Sabbath, a once-in-a-lifetime event that would culminate all the Sabbaths, an invitation to receive and enter into God's eternal rest. But it's also interesting because Luke makes the point it was very early on the first day of the week. Literally, it's the deep dawn. It's like that sliver of a moment before the sun appears when darkness flees and everything is bathed in light. It takes us back to the very beginning of the Bible story. It reminds us of Genesis when all was dark, when the spirit was hovering over those waters and suddenly God speaks and unveils his glorious light. It's like Luke slows down time for us here in this moment just to sit still in that sliver of a moment. It's the darkness of dawn. But God has already spoken because Jesus has already risen and day is about to come roaring to life. So it's the first day of the week because this day begins the first day of the new creation, a new day that will overshadow all other days. This is the moment all these images were pointing to, the dove, 
the Jubilee, the new Exodus, images of freedom and forgiveness and fullness and life. This is the day that darkness is defeated, death and disease, sin and Satan. Jesus is the grave robber who snatched life from the jaws of death. His tomb has become a womb, no longer a rest place for the dead, but a birthplace for the living. That's the invitation of Jesus' resurrection. It's to be born again, to come alive to God. It's the invitation to receive Jesus for who he is as Lord and Saviour and to come awake to this abiding hope and joy and peace. Because like Julia Baird says in her book, these are dark days we're living in. More than ever, we're confronted with the darkness of our world and the darkness of our own weaknesses and vulnerabilities and mortality. But on this Sunday, we gather to remember that first Sunday. We remember that God has spoken across the void of darkness and that even now God is speaking to us. And if you will receive it, his word is salvation and life and true light. There's an older pastor named Eugene Peterson who told this story. There was once these people who were living on an island. They were the descendants of castaways, but no one ever tells stories about that anymore. Few even remember what actually happened. But now, generations later, this island has become a pleasant place to live. Uh, the population is booming. Kids can grow up and get an education. People can work and marry. There are laws in the land that are good and just. Life is good and people are happy. One day, there's this one islander who's walking along the beach and he spots this old washed up bottle and inside there's this note. It says, help is coming. Strange, the islander thinks to himself, why would I need help? Don't I have everything I need? And yet the note stirs in him this strange awareness of something he can't name. So next week he returns to the beach and there's another bottle with a note in it. He opens it and it says, help will arrive soon. Don't give up. Twice is no accident, he says to a friend. So they start going to the beach together every week and they keep discovering these washed up bottles with notes. Help left yesterday. Take heart, help is coming. But it's absurd. We don't need any help. And yet there they are, week after week, returning to the beach, finding those same strange messages, telling them something they never knew they wanted to hear. Word got around and Soon there's a small gathering meeting every Sunday. Most people couldn't see what the excitement was about. There were plenty of fine books to read on the island. Why all the fuss about these silly little messages? But those who met together shared this awakened curiosity. Words were being used to describe realities that were beyond them, but could soon be among them. They were being addressed by someone and this person was at great pains to get their attention and get their message across. They were hearing things they didn't know they needed and suddenly the world seemed so much bigger than their tiny little island. And that's what drew them back to the beach week after week. You know, today we gather to remember our God who crossed the greatest distance and who went to the most extraordinary lengths to rescue us. God has addressed us from across the void of darkness and death. He's come to us. The world is so much bigger than we could have ever hoped or imagined. Come and receive his light and life. Will you join me as we pray together? Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we just want to give you thanks today, on, on this day, on this Sunday. Lord, thank you that you have opened our eyes and opened our hearts to see the Lord Jesus Christ. 
to see him risen and reigning at your right hand. Lord, thank you that he rules from heaven there right by your side before your heavenly throne. Thanks, Lord, that he rules over all of creation. Lord, thank you that Jesus stands tall above the darkest days of our life. And Lord, thank you that on this day, on Resurrection Sunday, Lord, we can come and receive an abiding hope and joy and peace. Father, we just ask that you would meet with us now by your spirit, that you would, our, that you would comfort our hearts to receive this gift. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen.